told you that uh, Psalm 103 has a lot in it. Uh, there's actually 22 verses. I think, we've, I think we've got to about verse 5. That's taken us two weeks so far. I'm hoping today, I'm going to make a statement of faith, we're going to get through the rest of this psalm today, and, and not in an extended you know, afternoon session. I mean, just in this session. So it's a bit of a summary, a bit of an overview, and hopefully take away the main messages and the main purpose of Psalm 103 to get us to, to know and to, and to engage in praising God, to understand the power of that praise and to understand what he's done for us. Psalm 103, let me read it to you again. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He doesn't treat us the way our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as the high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass, they flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. I ask you a question, how do you know that God is good? I've heard you say it before, I've heard you sing about God's goodness, I just want to know how you know. How do you know God is good? Sorry? All the good things he does for us. Well, a lot of people have heard about the good things that God has done. They've read the Bible, they know he did good things to Moses, they did good things to David. I believe what they say, God is good. You ever had, um, you ever asked someone for a good doctor? We came to Sunbury and we didn't know any good doctors. It doesn't mean there weren't any, we just didn't know any. So we asked friends, people that we trusted. Now, I don't know whether you should ask a well person if they know a good doctor, because they probably don't count. It's a person who's been really sick, you should ask, because if they know a good doctor, that's, you're really onto something. I think the first couple that someone says, oh, yes. This person's a really good doctor. So we rang up. Can we see you? No, we don't have any appointments for two weeks. Oh, are you a patient already? No, oh, sorry, we're taking no new patients. Now, it might be a really good doctor. Well, we will never know. <laughs> we will never know. Why? Because we didn't get to go to see the doctor. We didn't get to experience what that doctor could deliver. He might be a terrific doctor, but we just didn't actually, actually know. And there's a difference between knowledge about and knowledge. And the biblical understanding of know is to know for yourself, to experience in your own life, in what you know from you, from you taking it in and experiencing it, you know. It's intimate knowledge of. It's knowing God as a person, as someone who you've engaged with and your spirit is one with his spirit. You know that you know God. It's not that you have a theology about God, that you've heard someone else tell you about God. You actually know. You know that the doctor is good because you knock on his door, he gives you an appointment, you walk into his, into his surgery, and he's kind, and he's loving. I, I should say she, I, you know, just not to be prejudiced, okay? She is loving and kind. Now, I don't actually, no, I'll stick with male because that, that suits me. Uh, I've been to a female doctor a couple of times, but generally I prefer males. 
I don't know why. I, I'm really happy the dawn goes to a female doctor. So let's let's get that out of the road. That just confused me there for a minute. <laughs> so the doctor's good because they're kind, because they speak words that are gentle, because they explain to you what's going on in your body. I remember one doctor who diagnosed an osteoma in my head, and he explained it to me and showed me what it was and, and, what, and why it was serious and why I needed to, to take the next step with him and trust him to get surgery. It was major surgery. I wasn't about to jump into something. But I knew because of his explanation and because of his scientific background and because of his persuasiveness and because he actually had my best interests at heart, I trusted him. Here I am today because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that doctor diagnosing me. See, David knew that God is good. And when, he's, when he addresses this Psalm 103, he gives his soul a little talking to. Praise the Lord, my soul. It's like taking his soul out for a walk and saying, I'm going to just put things straight with you. Get yourself, get your act into gear here, soul. Because he actually, in, in talking to his soul, he says, praise, the, praise my soul, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sins. Who's he talking? Who's the your? It's his soul. Your sins. David, your sins have been forgiven. He's talking to himself. He's talking to his own soul. David, your, your diseases have been healed. God has been merciful to you. He has lifted you up. See, David is talking to his own soul as if it's a third party. So he's actually talking from first-hand experience. He's talking from the knowledge he has because he has been through this particular experience in which that which is good of God has met him at his point when he's not so good. And here's a major point I want you to get from this psalm and from, from, from this morning is that the goodness of God is only really felt and revealed into the lives of those people to whom that goodness matters, to whom that goodness makes a difference, who receive that goodness because they recognize a need before God that only his goodness can meet. Did you know that angels have a difficulty praising God for his grace? Not that, not that they don't see that he's gracious probably, and know that. But see, angels don't receive grace like we do. We are sinners, deserving of the death separation that has come because we've said to God, no, thank you very much. We'll do our own thing. And we've experienced the chaos and the death and the confusion that comes from that rebellion. But when we turn that around, when, when the compass of our heart turns to God and pleads for his grace, we experience undeserved favor. How do you know grace? People who are righteous in their own eyes, particularly, and they're dangerous kind of people. I've been there, I've probably been dangerous a lot of times, so I can't really point the finger too much. But people who are righteous in their own eyes are dangerous because they don't understand the depth of the grace that they actually need. The Pharisees of Jesus' time were dangerous people to others who were seeking God because they assumed that by their own works, by the things they had done, they'd achieved that right relationship with God because they kept the law. And there were desperate people who were sinners, tax collectors and prostitutes and the outcasts of society, the people that Jesus said, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, who need the doctor. Who, need, who needs a doctor? Those who are not well. And for, and for Jesus to come proclaiming the kingdom of God, he was saying, to such as these, I have come with God's grace and mercy. Unfortunately, you Pharisees, you, you cut yourself off from God's grace because you assume you don't need it. Now, some of the things that we know, we rehearse from the past. Personally, I wasn't there when Jesus died on the cross. Uh, I think I'm in good company here this morning. Is that right? Yet, yet we will faithfully, week by week, in, in our singing, in our praying, in our, in our devotions, in our communion setting, we will proclaim the goodness of God through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because that event of the past has altered and changed where we are and why we are here now. It's like David says, God revealed himself to Moses and made known his ways by delivering the people of Israel. David wasn't there when that happened, but he was in Israel because it happened. And so the goodness of God had come down to him through the generations. So this part of God's goodness that we inherit that comes down the line of that which has been done before in previous generations. I mean, in Australia, we're celebrating, you know, Christian Heritage Sunday today. We're we sort of, well, we have hardly recognized it, but we tried a little bit to say, let's remember, 
Oh, we have a Christian heritage as a nation. Now, it's been eroded, we know that. We know that secular humanism has come into our parliaments, into our media, into our academic circles, into the elite, the cultural elite of Australia, and eroded that which was a Christian heritage. And sometimes as Christians, we're getting a little bit antsy about that. I get a little bit, oh, we should get back in there and put Christianity back where it belongs. But you know something? This grace of God, this goodness of God comes by the knowledge of God's grace to each heart and every person, every Australian could actually receive that and they become a new inheritance of God. It's, it's the inheritance of this generation that matters. God's grace and his mercy. How do we know God? We know that God acted in the past because we have the present continuous results of that action of the past. Jesus' death and resurrection. I know his forgiveness because Jesus died on the cross for me. I know what I know now because of what Jesus did. It was, it was done. My sins were forgiven. I'm going to say to you this morning that to know the goodness of God is to experience that goodness in your life at the point of need where your faith intersects with God's abundant provision of his grace and his mercy and his goodness. And yet you know something? There are a lot of Australians who received the goodness of God and they wouldn't even recognize that God's alive. There's a lot of people who are friends in our community who live around us who have received in abundance, in bucket loads, the goodness of the Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. That by his power, our breath is sustained. The last breath you just took was by the power of God. The fact that your, the molecules your body hold together, the Bible says, is by the word of God, by God's decreed word. By his word, all things came into being and are held by his word. He's a good God. I know you're Baptist, but amen's okay. It's biblical. Even hallelujah a few times, if you want to throw that in. If you're not Baptist and you're free, then show us how to do it. Just go for it. What does Psalm 103 say? What does David say, this I know about God? Let me just give you the, the catalogue. You can look this up for yourself. That God is forgiving. That God heals. That God redeems us from the pit. That God is loving. That he's compassionate. That he's caring. That he works righteousness for the oppressed. He's a just God that he delivers the oppressed, that he reveals his ways and his word, that he is gracious, that he is patient, slow to anger, that he is not condemning, he is not resentful, he doesn't hold on to grudges, he's merciful, he's eternally loving, he's sovereign, he's all-knowing, he is condescending. That word is not a put down, that's he comes to our level. He comes into where we are, he enters our life. How do we know that? How can we know that those things are true about God? Let me suggest some of the human conditions that are also in Psalm 103, which are represented as the context in which that goodness comes. That man is sinful, that we are prone to disease, that we are lonely, that we are loveless, that our lives are often in a pit of despair, that we're needy, that we're tired, that we're oppressed, that we're in bondage, addiction, oppression, that we're ignorant, that we're under condemnation and we're weak. So, does that describe anyone here? Like, one out of ten? Three? <laughs> Four? <laughs> Felt all like that? It's like, it's like Jesus said about, uh, you know, about the, the, the prostitute, that the, the more you're forgiven, the more you love. <laughs> the more you're forgiven. Why? When you realize the depth of, of your sin and, and your own unworthiness, and then God says, but I love you anyway. Come here. That embrace. That embrace, that's, that's the embrace of the prodigal son. While the older brother is still working out in the field, jealous of the fact that his younger brother has been embraced by the father and taken in to have a fatted calf uh, celebration, he's out in the field bemoaning the fact that he didn't get enough. You see, his condition wasn't that he was smelling and smelling like pigs and he'd been out in the pig pen and that he'd been in a far country that he was lost. And both the father and the younger son knew that that reconciliation meant that the father's goodness had met the son's need. And there was an older brother out in the paddock who thought, what is this younger bloke? What is he doing? What right has my father got to give him anything? Didn't he give him enough to start with? It was the older brother who missed out. He was too proud of his own achievements and his own status with the father to receive what the father wanted to pour out even into his life. John 9 tells us a story of Jesus was going along the road with his disciples and they came across a, a man who was born blind from birth. And if you've been in a third world country and seen blind people, they don't have settling. 
They don't have disability pensions. They don't have a means of income. They don't have a way of working. They don't have, often don't have people look after them. The blind are the poorest of the poor because all they can do is sit there and wait for someone to put money into their, into their little pan. And this blind man had probably sat in the same place because one of the things about uh, begging for money on the streets, it can get very territorial. <laughs> Outside of Coles is a very good place maybe, you know, you, and that's your spot. And you're not going to let anyone take your spot because you want to get everybody coming out with their extra food and you're going to, if some other beggar comes here, that halves your income, just like that, just gone. So there, there is a sense in which this blind man had had a lifestyle that was built around being where he was, being helpless, being weak, being blind from his birth. And Jesus' disciples said to him, who, who actually sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What's the reason for this blindness? Who's to blame for the fact that he's blind? Now, there's a whole lot of theology that we can go into about that. But let me just say, the short story is that it's the place and race that he was in that's a problem the human race and the place of depravity and sin, which had caused whatever is a defective from God's perfect creation. So that's kind of his condition. But Jesus' answer is interesting. He said, neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as his day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made a mud pack and put it on the guy's eye and said to him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And apparently the word Siloam means sent. He sent him to the pool of Siloam. And when he washed, it says he came back seen. Now, I don't know whether that story grips your heart, but I think Jesus said this happened. This man was born in that, into that situation so that the, the manifest glory of God might be displayed in him. The things that God wanted to do, the goodness of God, would be shown in a man who now, who was blind, born blind, but now can see. Do you know what his friend said? See, he looks like the blind man, but I think it's just a look-alike. I don't think it's really him. It's pretty hard to testify how God is so good when you look so different, or, you know, you're doing something different and you're free, and, and they say, oh, can't be the same person. We know that other person. Did this man know that God restores sight? Did he have an inclination that God was a God who restored sight? Had he seen anyone else with their eyes open? <laughs> no. He'd never seen anyone else at all. He'd, he'd have heard voices around him. He'd probably felt people in different parts, but he, he had never seen anything. But when he received the word of God, when God's word was spoken through Jesus into this man's life, he believed what he heard, he acted on it, and the consequence, he received the goodness of God. He had his eyesight restored. What an amazing story. He's blind, he hears the word, he believes, and receives a miracle. There's a pattern in that. You see, God's goodness and his mercy and love and kindness and patience are always given in full measure, as it were, to everyone. God sends his rain on the just and the unjust. What's the problem? How come some people are so bitter about God? Some of the friends that I've talked to, I've tried to persuade to become a Christian. By the way, it's still legal to conversion therapy for people who are not believers to become believers. We say, hanging on to that part of it, you know. And the other, you know, I understand there's some illegalities going on, but let's, while we can still convert people to, to Jesus, let's do it quickly. <laughs> while we're still lawful, to say to someone who says, you know, I'm really struggling with not being a Christian. Can you help me, Pastor? No, 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 sorry. It's illegal. I don't want to go to jail. And so far, it's still legal. So let's hang on to that and keep promoting that because really some of the people that I talk to about becoming Christians and followers of Jesus and believing in him and receiving the goodness of God, they say, ah, oh, I can't believe in a God who did this and allowed my grandson to be so damaged and so forth. And it is, it is a problem. It can be a problem. But you know, it's into that very damage, into that very world of brokenness that Jesus comes. The incarnate word of God, the, the word in flesh, God's very word into that situation where God heals the sick, opens the eyes of the blind. And yes, we do have to wait sometimes. Sometimes it's not exactly on our time frame, not exactly when we want, but our faith is in a God who is always good, always just, always righteous. 
James says in chapter 1 and verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Last time I talked to a Christian going through really trials, they weren't actually rejoicing. They were telling me how bad it was and how hard it is. And I've done the same. When I've got a heavy heart, I've got a heavy heart. But James says, count it all joy. Reckon it as joy when you go through various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The perseverance finishes its work, may produce mature, complete, not lacking anything. Person. Wow. So there's something about suffering and difficulty which is universal. There's something about going through tough times which is really the truth of all humanity. Uh, a, a guy that I was reading up on this, uh, Joseph Stoll, um, in his book entitled The Upside of Down. It's a good title, The Upside of Down. Uh, Finding Hope When It Hurts. He says there that scripture uh, enumerates, uh, illustrates seven different kinds of trials, seven different sorts of trials. He says there's the trials of place and race, which I just referred to before. And that place and race trial is we are living in an environment that is... The place that we're in has been corrupted by sin and rebellion against God. The earth and all in it has been corrupted by man's rebellion. We're, we're placed in a crowning position to rule over the earth. And when we gave that to the usurper, when we gave our authority to Satan, it has wreaked havoc on the earth. Environmentally, socially, spiritually, physically, it has wreaked havoc. And that is a cause of most suffering and debilitation. We're a part of the human race. That's a trial. Then there are trials of temptation. We're allured by sin. We're tempted to do things that are contrary to what God says is the right way to do it. Now, here's, here's where people get into some interesting dilemmas. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I don't think God should tell me what to do. That's about as brave and as smart as saying to the car manufacturer, I don't care what your manual says. I'll put the oil where I blink and I'll feel like it. I want to put water in the petrol tank. I will. Don't you tell me what to do. Well, why would the manufacturer tell you what to do? Because he thinks the car will operate better <laughs> based on his engineering knowledge. It'll operate better for you if you do what he says. God is a loving God. He's a God of truth. He actually cares about relationships between men and women, between people, in churches, in community, in families. He cares about this stuff. And he gives us some really, really, really important advice. Call it laws if you like. Because they are. They're such important advice as do this. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't exalt yourself over others. Forbear one another in love. Bear one another. Be patient with one another. Be merciful and kind. Why does he say all that stuff? Because when you do, relationships work better. Forgive one another. Don't hold grudges. On and on he talks about relationships and about how we can be connected and how we know that we're different, but in the differences we actually discover that God's grace and his mercy is between us. Do you, do you know, do you know that, do you think about someone that you have the most problem relating to. No, don't start hating them. No, that's going to be, God knows what you're thinking. But you, you know, there's people in your life. I, I can think, that, as soon as I say that, I can think of a few people that if were it not for God's grace between him, me and that other person, we'd be, a, we'd be at war with each other. In fact, the problem, that's how we discovered we needed God's grace because there was a war because there was a conflict, because there was a fight, because there was something happening. And if we're to survive in this world, the, the relationship between me and others has to have God's grace in between it, has to have his goodness and his manifest goodness that comes between me and that person so that through that goodness, we both are humble enough to appreciate, God, you made that person. You love that person. You love them as much as you love me. I can see your image in that. You see, you can't see that if you're looking at them just as they are. You can only see that with the eyes of grace and mercy that God has given you. Consider it all joy. Trials of temptation. Trials of identification. Jesus says, they've done it to me, they'll do it to you. Being a Christian is not going to get very popular anymore. If it ever was. If it ever was. There are more, there are more people being persecuted and discriminated against in the world because of their Christian faith than any other cause on the planet. Jesus said, as he did it to me, they'll do it to you. That could cause you a trial. It's trials of discipline. God loves you enough to teach you things. I didn't like discipline at boarding school. I knew it was unjust. I knew it was unfair. <laughs> what I didn't know is that my character needed a bit of it. <laughs> what I didn't realize is how much that could be actually good in my life. Now, 
you've heard me tell some stories. My wife's heard me some stories. There are some parts of that that were not like good. They weren't completely from heaven. But we weren't going to that. The trials of God's discipline are that sometimes God is leading us to a place where our faith has been tested to trust him. And here's where we know the goodness of God. This is why experience is so important. When we hear God's word into our circumstance, when we take the time to bring in prayer to the Lord God Almighty to say, Father, let your will be done. Can you just show me what it is? Let your kingdom, your rule be in this situation. Can you show me how I can conform? More often we pray, Lord, that person's giving me a pain in the neck. Can you remove them, please? Lord, that person's causing me a lot of harm. Can you deal with them so I don't have to? What do you think the Lord's going to do with that prayer? He's going to wait until you're ready to pray for what he wants, which is how you can be the instrument of love and grace to them, how you can be his hands and his feet to that person. And there's the trials of the consequence of sin. The Apostle Paul, in his zeal to, to serve God, he used to have Christians put to death. People who were followers of Jesus were imprisoned and executed in front of him, Stephen being one of them. And you know, despite the fact that Paul knew that God had forgiven him, and he had forgiven him, and he knew the grace of God. Later in his life, as he writes to, to the churches, he says, I, the worst of sinners, the greatest of sinners, have received God's mercy. He, 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 could, never, he could never expunge from his memory the fact that he had once murdered Christians. And there's times when that's a trial to us. There's things that have happened that we cannot just remove from our lives. They happened and they've had a consequence. There's an effect of that. But God, but God, that God can use that very circumstance and turn around. How much did Paul love the believers? How much did he give himself to the nurture of those in faith? He said, I, I, I work with all the energy that he mightily aspires within me that I might present everyone mature before Christ. There's the trials of display. The trials of display are God wants to do like that blind man. Not because of his sin of his parents, not because of his sin, but because this man was to be for the display of God. Abraham and Isaac, a classic example, Genesis chapter 22. God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, and take him and sacrifice him on the mountain that I show you. Now, Abraham was living amongst pagan people who demonstrated their love for their God by sacrificing their children to their gods. I don't know whether that is abhorrent to you. It is to me. If God said to me, take your son and go and put him to death to prove you love me, I'd say, God, is there anyone else up there I can worship? <laughs> I'd be tempted to find another God. But Abraham was being tested in his faith as to whether his love for God was even greater than the pagans' love for God, the people of Canaan who worshipped other gods. And when he got up on that mountain of Mount Moriah with the knife in his hand, ready to take the life of his own son, God said, stay your hand. I know that you love me. And I will provide. And you know, on that mountain, on that hill, which ended up being outside of Jerusalem, the Father himself provided his own son as a sacrifice and didn't spare him because he wanted to save us. That's amazing. What an amazing grace. Does God want to display his grace and mercy through you? Paul says, I'll rejoice even more. He prayed three times, the thorn in the flesh would be removed. And then he discovered from God through revelation that this thorn in the flesh, this problem, this issue, this messenger from Satan that he called it, whatever that was plaguing him, when he discovered that God was saying, no, I'm not going to remove that from you because my grace is manifested through your weakness. He said, all the more will I glory in that. Lord, if this is what it takes, if, if going through this hard time and this hardship and putting up with this suffering is what it takes to glorify you and that's what you want, Gladly let it be. That's a trial, but it's met by God's goodness because he's with you. The psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your God and your staff, they comfort me. First time in the Psalms that he confesses the Lord is with him. It's in the moment of greatest testing. And, and the seventh one, if you're counting, is trials of broken expectations. Things that you expected were going to happen, things you hoped would happen, things that you wanted to happen. I don't think I've ever married a couple who stood at the altar and said, I love you and I'll do this for the rest of my life, who had any expectation other than this would be 
a wonderful marriage. Now, if they're realistic, they know it wouldn't be perfect right away. <laughs> but they never expected what could happen, that that marriage could end in disaster and brokenness. But even in that, even in that, the goodness of God is experienced to those who turn their hearts to God and say, God, have mercy, heal my heart, restore my soul. See, so many people use trials and difficulties as an excuse to turn away from God, when actually, if from Psalm 103, from David's point of view, by this I know the goodness of God, because in the midst of trials and difficulties, my human condition and all that I go through, I know that God is good because I've experienced his goodness. I have opened my heart and my faith to God, and by that faith, I have proven God is good. Let me tell you, my soul, remember, the Lord is good. Now, why should we praise him for that? Well, it's a funny thing, isn't it? You've got to keep telling yourself some good stuff because when you come to the next trial, you want to remember what you've learned. You want to stand there thinking, oh, I didn't expect this. Hey, if you know that life is going to be trials and difficulties, there's going to be temptations that come your way. There's going to be things that are unpleasant to you. If you know that's going to happen, then you've known the goodness of God in the past. How much more will that goodness be needed in this trial? What's God's plan? He actually wants to carve out a character and shape us so that we are more and more like Jesus. Now, if you think you've suffered enough, have a look at the cross and see if Jesus isn't the perfect example of turning the ultimate suffering into the greatest good and God's glory. I mean, it, you just have to stop and think about that. That at the moment when those Jewish leaders and those Roman rulers and the hosts of Satan believed that they had killed the Son of God and put him to death and dispensed with him, at that moment, as he gave his life for that, as he surrendered his life to that crucifixion and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. At that moment, the shackles of Satan were broken. The power of death was broken. The power of sin was broken because Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, I'll get a hallelujah one day, I'm sure. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I mean, what an amazing turnaround from the goodness of God. If, 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 if Jesus isn't the perfect example of God's goodness, he certainly, he, he certainly knew the goodness of the Father. That's why he could go to the cross. Many times we're, we're so afraid to go to the next test because we're, we're just not sure if we can do it. You actually just need God to do it. You need God's goodness to do it. You don't actually need to be so strong. You can punch your way through a wall and overcome in the name of Jesus. You actually overcome in the goodness of God, in the, in the mercy of God, in the kindness of God, in the grace of God. Does he forgive our sins? Well, it depends on whether you know that or not. Does he heal our diseases? Do you know that he heals diseases? Do you know that he delivers us from the enemy? Do you know that he provides good things? If you know the goodness of God, then praise him. Let your voice be the instrument that says, Oh my soul, praise the Lord. Uh, we're, we're living in an interesting uh, day and age, aren't we, of, of uh, what I call the ultimate individuality. Well, we all worship God in our own way. We do, unfortunately. Be nice if we did it God's way, though. Because when the Lord says, pray, when the Word of God says, praise the Lord, it actually means to declare with your voice. There, there's words in Hebrew, there's a variety of praise words, and I won't go into all of them here, but one of them is to shout to the Lord. Now, you want to hear a shout? Watch the BBL last night. Sydney Sixers, 30,000 people shouting their team on. What did that do for the team? You know the commentators call that? The twelfth man on the field. <laughs> that happens in church when we praise God. There's someone there who desperately needs to know that God is good. When we lift our voices in praise, when we declare our praise with our testimony, when we say, I praise God, He is good, He has provided for me. There's someone who needs that provision that day. When you testify to the goodness of God, there's someone who needs to hear. And maybe by hearing from you, their faith is lifted enough to say, maybe God could do that for me. Maybe, maybe, just maybe is open to me and his goodness will come into my life maybe you need to let your voice your life be an instrument of praise can I just say to you in closing then that I know a very good father that I can recommend to you if you feel like an orphan if your parents have died if they're not on the planet anymore if you don't have anyone who looks after you in that way I can recommend a really 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 good father and you know what he was the one who gave birth to you. He created you, knit, knit you together in your mother's womb. He put you together. He put you on this planet. He loved you from the very beginning. And one day you'll open your eyes and say, wow, you were there all, all along. 
you were there from the very beginning, weren't you? They say, yeah, that's why I brought you here today. <laughs> so you could know my goodness. Ephesians 3.10 says this. It is his intent. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who else? Who else can show the principalities and powers that rule over and destroy people's lives in Sunbury, the, the powers of darkness that destroy? Who else can show them the mercies and the kindness and the grace of God that liberates people apart from those who have been liberated by that power? Who else can declare the praise of a God who will deliver people out of the pit of despair except for those who have been there and been delivered? Who else can declare to those who are caught in sin and don't believe there even is a God that except for those who have known what it is to rebel against God and be redeemed by his grace? Who else can declare that? And if you don't declare it, and if I don't declare it, how will they know that God is good? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Say it louder, girl. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul for all his goodness, for all his mercy. As we bow our heads in this moment, there may be someone here today, and you say to me, if you were able to say it personally, I need God's goodness in my life in a certain area. I need to know his grace. I need to know that he forgives sins. I need to know that he heals. I need to know that he delivers. I need to know that he gives a second chance and a third and a fourth. I need to know that he restores my soul. I need to know that he's the joy giver. I need to know his goodness. And if, if that's you, I want you to put your hand up as we pray. Our eyes are going to be shut. I'm not looking around at anybody. I'm going to pray. But as I'm praying, if that is you, as an act of faith, you put your hand up and say, I need that goodness. I need God's goodness. I need his grace. I need his salvation today. I need to know Jesus as my personal savior. I need to know the Holy Spirit filling my life. I feel so empty and dry. I feel like I'm far away from the goodness of God. You talked about it, I hear about it, but it's like a distant call. I want to know it in one way. I want the emptiness of my heart to be filled with the goodness overflowing of God. That's for you today. Don't be afraid to put your hand up. You're gonna to need to put your faith up anyway. Because that's the only way you're going to receive from God. I'm putting your, your, your faith, maybe even put both your hands and say, here I am, Lord. Fill this vessel with your goodness. Now, I, if, if you're a believer today and you walked in here full of joy and life is sweet and you've had a great time, doesn't mean you can't receive more of God's goodness. It's just you may not realize how, how needy you are sometimes. But there's people here today, I'm sure, who've come with broken hearts and broken lives. And you want to say to God, I need your goodness. You're going to take time to do that. It's going to change your life. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those today who need the goodness of your salvation. Who need the goodness of what Jesus did on the cross. Die for sin rose again to give eternal life. If you need that goodness of God, receive it now. Put your hands to the Lord and say, Lord, that's me. Father, I pray this morning for those who in their bodies are suffering ailments, diseases, dis-ease, mentally, emotionally, physically, socially. I pray for healing. I pray for reconciliation, if that's you. Receive from God his goodness. The impartation of his goodness by the Holy Spirit.
Father, I pray for those who feel like their lives are in a hole, in the pit of despair, that's just darkness, depression. There's no way out. Have mercy. Shine your light, Father. Reveal your truth. Set them free by your truth. If that's you, receive. Receive from the Father the word of his goodness, the truth of his goodness. Father, I pray for those this morning who are bound in addictions. It's as if the enemy has put chains around them and they can't break free. It's mental or physical, whatever is the source of that. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'd set them free by your goodness and by your power, by your grace and your mercy break the shackles of the enemy we stand against all that he does and all that he says and the lies that lives can't be changed that circumstances cannot be altered that hearts cannot be filled with mercy and love and kindness if that's you receive the freedom and the goodness of god Father, I pray for those who have sinned in their life. And though they've asked and repented and asked and repented, they feel that that sin is still with them. Show them that in your grace you remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. That you remove those things from our presence, from our lives as we confess them. That we can trust you for that. Take away those things. Wash them as white as snow. Make them as clean as if they'd never sinned. Show them what you can do in their hearts by your goodness, by your mercy, by the blood of Jesus Christ. If that's you, receive in the name of Jesus your deliverance from sin and guilt and shame. Break its power in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for those who are lonely today, who feel like orphans and widows and aliens in this country and in this community, who feel that they're alone, that no one really cares for them, that they don't really belong. Father, by your goodness, bring them into your family. Bring them into relationships that are helpful, that are hopeful, that are meaningful, that give life, because you are there in the midst, because it's you that gives life. Because it's you that loves, it's you that brings the lonely and embraces the one and the twos that are on their own, the ones that are separated from, from loved ones, separated from love and from, from friendship. In the name of Jesus, and speak your truth into their hearts, Father, that they're loved of the Father, loved by the Son, and have the love of the Spirit within them. Receive that in Jesus' name. And so, Father, for many, in every trial, in every difficulty, in every circumstance of life, you are good. And we pray that by faith today, each of us, whatever our need, wherever we are, may have that faith and revelation to receive from you that impartation of your goodness, the revelation of your purpose, the intention of your heart, the manifestation of your power, the presence of your Holy Spirit, and the grace to overcome pray these things in the wonderful and blessed and good name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's um, important to make a, a stand for what you've declared in your own heart. And this is where it gets a bit tough and a bit embarrassing, maybe. But if this morning God has spoken to you and you've had that sort of interaction with him where you've said, yes, Lord, that's me. I I want to receive from you. And you want to declare that. You want to make a stand and say, that's me. I'm, I'm that person in need and I'm going to pursue God. I'm, I'm open to his goodness. I'm seeking out. You pray that sincerely from your heart. And you'll know who you are right now because you start to get a little bit edgy. You start to get nervous. You can't help that. 
sometimes your palms sweat if you're that kind of person and you think, oh, what's he going to ask me to do? I'm just going to ask you to stand up and come to the front and declare the fact that Jesus is good in your life and you are actually needing that today. Why don't you just pray again for you as a, as a service closes? If you want personal prayer, you want someone else to pray with you, they can come too. But I want you to do that as a stand today because sometimes it, it, it stands it in your mind, it actually fixes it, that this is a day in which you said to the Lord, yes, Lord. It might be the very first time. If that's it, that's a fantastic thing to say. It might be that you've never actually broken through in the area of the Holy Spirit filling your life and you've said, well, I just feel dry and barren. You just you want prayer for that. Any of those things we mentioned. But if that's you today and you actually know the Lord's saying, come, take that stand, confess me before these people. This is easy here. This is church. <laughs> Confessing his goodness. Confessing that he is a good God for you and you're going to receive that by faith. That's all we want to do is make sure that you've made that step. Come as we see. Come stand to sing, have thy own way. Oh, no. 